Hi guys, today we're going to talk about the theorems that we're going to use from now on to find the limits, okay? Um, before, again, it was all epsilon and delta, but now we're going to have tools that are going to enable us to find limits. So the limit theorems without proof, if you guys want the proofs, I can make another video, so comment below if you want that, but this video does have no proofs at all. So says if a now a, this symbol means in okay or belonging so if a is an element of the real numbers therefore a is a constant that's what it means and then the limit when x approaches c of f of x is equal to l and the limit when x approaches c of g of x is equal to m then and then i'm going to list all the theorems that satisfied by, by those two limits. Notice one thing before I continue is that both of them approach the same value in X. Okay, that's very important because if it's different values then you can't use these theorems. They both have to approach the same value in X. So they both approach C. But the values in the limit are different. Okay, they don't have to be different but let's assume they're different to, to see it more clearly, they can be the same value also, it doesn't matter. L and M are real numbers also, okay? So, the first one is very intuitive, is that the limit of, the limit when X approaches C of the sum of my functions is equal to the limit of, the sum of the limits, okay? Um, you can also have it this way, where you can equal them as the limit when x approaches c of f of x plus the limit when x approaches c of g of x okay which is equal then to l plus m this pro this theorem is called linearity so it the sum of the limits is the limits of the sum. And you're going to see that in calculus a lot, okay? Differentiation, integration, and all that jazz. So for now, that's the first one. Now, I'm not going to use any examples until I go through all of them. Um, because once you have a whole list of theorems that you can use, then it's going to make more sense in how to use them. So the second one, let me move the cursor. Um, is that the limit when x approaches c of my constant times my function is equal to the constant times the limit of x approaches c of f of x which is equal to a times the value of the limit okay in other words you can pull out constants out of the limit okay now on one that is not here uh, i'm gonna write it now is that the limit when x approaches c of a is equal to a okay so the limit all it's a function operator a you can define a as a function f of x equals a that's a horizontal line and it still applies to the, the you can apply the limit to that function but it doesn't change anything because there's no x value for which it's approaching like for whatever value of x is always going to be the value a so that's a little obvious but again i don't like to use that word in mathematics right so yeah so the the limit of a constant is the constant the limit of a constant times a function is the constant times the limit of the function okay that's what the second theorem states now this one is not intuitive just because for differentiation and integration is not this is not equal but for limits it is so the limit when x approaches uh, c of f of x times g of x so if the two functions are being multiplied then the the value of that limit is going to be the the both limits being multiplied and just like the first one i can have this equality also so the limit when x approaches c of f of x times the limit 
when x approaches c of g of x. Okay? So you can break the, the, those two multiplications in two different limits. Okay? And then you can find the limits and then multiply the values. That's what it's saying. Okay? Now, for this one, if the sum works, then the different difference will work also, right? You just have to substitute plus with a negative g of x. And there you have it. You've proven that already. So the limit when x approaches c of f of x minus g of x is equal to the value of the limit minus the, the value of the limit of g, okay? And just like I did in the first one in the, in the multiplication, I can break that into two separate limits, right? So f of x minus the limit when x approaches c of g of x. Okay? Now this one is very critical, it's, it's, it's one of the most important ones, is division. Okay? So the limit when x approaches c of 1 over g of x is equal to 1 over m given that m is not equal to 0. Okay? Why can't we have 0 in the denominator? Because we can't divide by 0. So notice, and this is the key factor of limits, this is where we're going to be using it over and over again is that we never said that g of x cannot be equal to zero. So it is, it is obvious that g of x cannot be equal to zero, but you can have values in your domain that, that we can, um, we can separate, exclude values from the domain, but still use them for the limit. And it's gonna make more sense for, for when I start doing examples. But for now, notice that m is not equal to zero, the value of m, g of x, doesn't, cannot be equal to zero, but we're not gonna restrict the, we're gonna restrict the domain, but we're not gonna restrict the values of the limit that we're gonna use. So even if a value is not in the domain of my function, I can still find the limit approaching that value, okay? That's what I meant, that's like the key for limits. So that's gonna come in handy once we start doing examples. Now the last one is, the, is very similar to the previous one where the limit when x approach of, of division of two functions is equal to the, the division of each value of the limit. And just like the multiplication, you can write it as two separate limits, right? divided by okay so the limit is very flexible and it's more flexible than any other operation um, because it, even even if I haven't shown it yet that will come in late, later but it can also be you can apply the limit inside a, a composition of function and that's very powerful because not many things can go inside compositions of functions, okay? So this limit operator, you can, you know, move it anywhere around. You can move it to exponents. You can move it inside square roots. You can move it outside square roots. It's very flexible, the limit. And it's very powerful because then you can find limits of anything, basically. So... These are all the theorems or the tools that we're gonna use, okay? Now I'm gonna give an example and we're gonna start using them to make more sense of them. So the first one, let's say we have f of x equals x plus one and g of x equals square root of x, okay? You have two functions. Now I'm gonna take the limit when x approaches 4 of f of x and then I'm going to take the limit when x approaches 4 of g of x and you're going to tell me what's the value well if x is approaching 4 of this function where is it approaching at in the value of, of f of x well clearly there's no gaps 
in this function, right? X plus one is a, is a diagonal line. There's no breakage. So it's gonna approach the value of F of four, okay? So it's almost like applying the value inside the function. And you're gonna have, once you start practicing, you're gonna feel that that's what we're doing. You're, oh, we're just plugging in the function. But it, it, it goes a little different once we start having restrictions of domains, okay? That's where the limit starts going its own way. So for now, you're gonna feel like, wait, what's the difference between plugging in this value and then finding the limit? Well, for these particular functions, there's not much difference. It's exactly the same, actually. Um, but once we start doing more complex functions, then you're gonna understand what the difference is. So for the first one, the limit when x approaches f of x is the limit of x plus one, right? So the limit when x approaches four of x plus one. That's your function. And we know by the, prop, by the theorems that you can break these two limits. So this is the limit when x approaches four of x plus the limit when x, x approaches four of one. And this becomes what? Well, the limit when x approaches four of x is just four because there's no gaps for, for, for that function x. So this is just four. Then the limit of a constant is the constant. So this is just one. So four plus one is five. So this, five, so this limit is five, okay? And then for this one, we'll have to use the, the fact that you can put inside the, the limit inside the, function, the, the composition of functions. So this is the limit when x approaches four of square root of x. This is equal, and I didn't state that as a theorem. I'm, trust me on this one. This is just basic trust. I'll give another video where we're gonna start doing that a lot. But because I chose square root of x, I have to show it. Uh, this is equal to the square root of the limit when x approaches four of x, which we know it's already four. But the square root of four is two. So this is equal to, oops, not that one. This one is equal to two. So now we found we've we have the values of my two limits. Now I'm gonna manipulate these two functions and we're gonna find the values of the new limits, okay? So for example, let's find the limit when x approaches four of f of x plus g of x, okay? We know by the theorem that we can separate these two limits into two different sums. But we can jump that step and go straight to the theorem that says that this is equal to m plus l. But what is m for my example? m here is five, right? It's the value of the limit for, the, for f of x. So this is five. And then plus l, I mean not, l is five, sorry, m is two. So two. So this is seven. So the limit of f of x plus g of x is seven, okay? Now, how would that look like in terms of my example? So this is equal to the limit. I'm trying to avoid the lagging of f of x, which is x plus one, plus g of x, which is square root of x. So we've created a new function x plus one plus square root of x is a new function. And we found the limit just by separating into two different functions. So that limit is equal to seven. Okay, notice you can go, you can also apply the limit to that function. So it would have been four plus one plus square root of four, which is seven, okay? So again, it, it looks very, it looks like we're just plugging in the value of, a, of a four in the, into the, the function, 
but not necessarily. And again, I'm going to emphasize that because it's important that you don't, you don't determine yourself that it's always just plugging in. Okay, it's not always like that. So now let's do subtraction. So the limit when x approaches four of trying to avoid the lagging f of x minus g of x well you guessed it right what's the limit what is the value of this limit is 5 minus 2 which is 3 okay now let's do the constant one choose any constant my favorite constant is pi because whenever people see pi in any calculus problem they freak out they they blank themselves they stop doing what they're doing and they just like i'm not gonna do this there's a pi there uh, i'm not gonna go forward so don't freak out pi is a constant it's a real number just like any other so for example the limit when x approaches 4 of pi times f of x okay this can be translated as pi times x plus 1, right? But because pi is a constant, I could pull it out of the limit. That's what the theorem says. And this becomes then pi times the limit when x approaches 4 of x plus 1, which we know is 5. So this is pi times 5 which is 5 pi, right? If you want to write it neatly. You see? So, and that happens with any constant, square root of 2, 1 half, 3 halves, whatever you want, okay? So you can pull out constants out of the limit, and that's a very useful tool. We're going to be using that a lot. Now, how about multiplication? So limit when x approaches 4 of x plus 1 times square root of x. Now, if I were to find the value, I just need to multiply the limits, right? That's what the theorem states. So this is equal to what? To the limit of x plus 1 times the limit of square root of x when x approaches 4. So what is the limit of x plus 1? Well, it's 5. What is the limit of square root of x? It's 2. So this value is 10. Okay? Now let's do the division. Let's use the of g of x. So 1 over square root of x. Notice that the value of the limit, m, is not 0. So this is equal to what? Well, 1 over 2, which is the value of the limit. And then if we do the multiplication, the division of the functions, So x plus 1 divided by square root of x, this is equal to what? Well, it's the value of the limit on the numerator divided by the value of the limit on the denominator, which is 5 over 2. Okay? And the and this video is done for, for today where I've shown how to use all the theorems with two uh, functions that I've given. Okay? If you like the video, please like, uh, press the like button and subscribe to Motivao. I'm going to keep um, developing more videos for you guys. For the next video, I'm going to give more complex examples where we're going to use all of them at once or almost all of them. Okay, so I hope you enjoy it, share it, love it and have a great day. Take care.